Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's talk on the uh, modern mainframe, which is using GitHub for social coding on mainframe code. I'm Phil Holler, and I'm a solutions engineer here at GitHub. Uh, good morning, all. My name is Venkat Balabhadra Patwani. I'm the architect uh, at Broadcom, and I am responsible for the enterprise DevOps suite in uh, Broadcom. So as we're all here talking about modern application development, it makes a lot of sense to talk about mainframe computers, because uh, in the words of the mainframe, loosely uh, adapted from elsewhere, rumors of its demise have been greatly exaggerated. And so what do we exactly mean by that? Well, when some people think mainframe, they're thinking of the 1950s era computers that would take up an entire room or two. But the, the mainframe heritage has continued to evolve over time as we continue to move into the 1980s. And then today, with mainframes taking up uh, a, a standard Z system, they're taking up a, a rack or two in your data center and providing a lot of capability that businesses depend upon each day. And you know, there's always hype in any sort of new technology era. And that technology is really that this new deployment or architecture or this new pattern is going to completely displace the prior pattern. And so we've seen that in history over time. At first, it was that distributed servers and then desktops were going to replace the mainframe. But they didn't completely do that. And then containers were supposed to kill distributed servers. That hasn't happened either. And then, of course, serverless came around to kill it all. But the reality is that each new architecture is an opportunity to optimize for the best purposes of that deployment pattern. And so for mainframes. So, so I guess you know the obvious question, why mainframe? And I, I'd like to think, look, think of it as, why not mainframe, right? It's been there for ages. And it, you know, the qualities of surface that, that, that mainframe actually provides in terms of the throughput, scalability, security, reliability, that's unmatched, right? Uh, and then uh, the, the key thing here is mainframe continues to serve as the backbone for, for you know, retail, airline, finance, insurance, government industries today. So there are some statistics in here that, you, that actually prove the relevance of mainframe and the importance of mainframe in the current industry. So any of you who have actually used a, a credit card today, yesterday, whenever, right? The chance is that your credit card, that particular transaction was actually touching a mainframe on the back end. That's how pre prevalent it is out there. And yes, it, it still exists. But that presence and that technology presents a number of challenges for today because a lot of those patterns that are around have been in place for a long time. And so there are really, you know, the standard DevOps challenges that exist for any other pattern or any other deployment environment are present even more so on the mainframe. There are challenges around the processes that are involved in actually getting code from the point that it's written through testing and into production. The technological challenges of getting it through that process. And then, of course, the human, the cultural, the people challenges of adapting to new workflows and new technologies. And so as we start looking at some of those challenges, one of the more obvious ones is, is a people challenge. And that is that most mainframe developers out there are seasoned developers. But that code isn't going anywhere, and there need to be people to maintain that. So on average, right now, about 7% of mainframe developers that are actively maintaining and producing COBOL are under the age of 30. But almost 30% are over 60 and approaching retirement. And this is going to create a pretty significant skills gap and shortage as the knowledge and all the capability that is currently maintaining those applications and workloads ends up leaving the workforce, leaving a large hole to be filled in their place. And then there's the process challenge. Vincott mentioned all of those core business systems that we rely on day to day for credit card transaction processing, airline ticketing, all these other systems. And a lot of teams are building things on top of those core business functions, whether that be a mobile application that allows you to perform your financial transactions or your airline's mobile application that allows you to interact with the ticketing system, they're all moving at the pace of agile, rapid workflows and are often dependent upon changes to that underlying mainframe system that's stuck in a very legacy waterfall process where things have to be planned out weeks to months ahead of time before they even bother to get into production, tying up the ability to deploy that new application, that new capability out to the customer base. And then, you know, last but not least, is the tools, right? So how many people are actually familiar with those, those screen caps up there? OK, these, these are the traditional <laughs> ISPF green screens. And is everybody sitting? Believe it or not, that is the primary IDE today. 
in 2019 when it comes to mainframe organizations. And I'm not kidding, okay? So that's the state of tools. Now, I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing. That's how the, the, the mainframe industry has evolved over a period of time, right? Because of the heritage and the legacy that's been there over the last 50, 60 years, you know, the tools that people have been using at that particular time, which were great, you know, they built up the muscle memory, right? And they are really productive and it's amazing how productive they are. But that's the state of the, the, the current uh, affairs. And then, you know, so in order to modernize some of that stuff, uh, Eclipse tools were born and, you know, they took a stab at modernizing those green screen interfaces. Uh, so a lot of vendors have actually provided the plugins. To, and then the ch challenge always existed because, because of the history, right, the 30, 40, 50 year history, organizations have tried to solve the problem, which means they have built proprietary tools around it. So the integration of those proprietary tools and bringing them into you know, the fold became a problem when it comes to tools. And so these challenges are onboarding going because if you're going to be a relatively new developer in the mainframe space, not only do you have to potentially learn a new language, COBOL, which languages are relatively easy to pick up, people learn them all the time, you've got to learn an entirely new and quite antiquated process in order to get that code into pr production, the new tooling, everything that's involved with that, which is markedly different than probably anything you've ever touched as a developer before. This creates a problem for recruitment because who wants to go learn 30-year-old technology and process in order to get the job running? And who wants to have to deal with that constant context switching if they're going to be maintaining mainframe code part-time and then have to switch over to distributed code or code for mobile or desktop applications? So the, really, this kind of begs the question, what other platform out there requires this much specialization? And the fact is, right now, it's none. All of those other deployment targets are use pretty much the same tooling and process in order to get the code through. And that doesn't have to be the case for mainframe anymore. And modernization isn't new on the mainframe. Uh, modernization has continued to occur over and over again as mainframes have supported things like virtualization and containerization and scalability and persistent encryption for a number of years. But what hasn't modernized as of yet is that process. And we're up here today to talk about how the, that is no longer the case with the tools that are present. And the first step in that was, honestly, it's a port for Git. So Rocket Software, uh, a couple of years back, created an open source port of Git to run natively on ZOS. This is what starts to enable branch-based workflows and more modern iterative development on mainframe application. And with code in Git, we can then start integrating other more modern tools and processes and start uh, removing a lot of those from those mainframe-specific antiquated tools into a more modern framework. And this really gets at that pressing need to modernize that application stack, modernize the development tooling, so that organizations can more easily bring people into the mainframe development fold and continue to maintain those workloads that everyone depends upon. And talking about open source, right? One of our, our philosophies at Broadcom internally, as well as what we are actually telling our customers is, you know, mainframe can actually embrace open source. And we, along with IBM and Rocket Software, actually uh, created a consortium called uh, Zoe. It is the first ever mainframe-based open source project. It's under the open uh, mainframe, uh, under the, the Linux Foundation. So the goal here is to actually make mainframe be like any other platform, right? In this current day and age, you know, mainframe has been siloed for a very long time. It has been considered as, oh my God, this is, you know, this antiquated machine, you know, using antiquated languages and things like that, that has been kind of kept away from, from the normal flow. But with the current change and trends in the industry, organizations want to standardize on a common stack, right? Mobile to mainframe is, is a reality. It is there today. So from an enterprise point of view, they would like to have a consistent set of tooling and processes and workflows across the board, whether they are actually developing mainframe or mobile, right? And Zoe is an open source project that is actually opening up the doors you know, for, for open source to, to, to mainframe. So one of the key components of uh, Zoe is a CLI. So, and this picture pretty much paints the picture, right? It, it's, it says the story for you. 
So today, you can see you know, developers actually using CLI to interact with AWS, Azure, right? Why can't we have the same thing for mainframe, right? Why should mainframe be different? So Zoe CLI actually enables that kind of capability to interact with mainframe. Now, one of the key things that Zoe is also driving from a modernization perspective is for it or for, for anybody to actually use the CLI, you know, there are, this, this picture shows you some, some you know, mainframe related technologies. Some are basically infrastructural pieces, some are actually the middleware software that's actually running there. But in order to actually leverage CLI, right, what it forced is everybody to think about APIification. So all of those infrastructural pieces, middleware software, now have REST APIs that can be you know, invoked through a CLI interface. And the idea of CLI is anything that you can run on CLI can be scripted, which means you can actually automate it. So this is a way for us to actually bring mainframe into the fold and have tools like, you know, consistent set of tools for CI, CD be used in, in the flow. So there's a couple of different approaches to being able to start utilizing tools like the Zoe CLI and the APIs that are there and then all of the other automations that are present in Git. And ultimately, it comes down to a decision of replace or interface. So one option is, of course, to take all the code that exists in your existing mainframe SCM and bring it directly into Git and use Git natively going forward. Depending upon how much heritage and how much uh, mainframe code you have and how many decades of processes are built in, that may or may not be a very large task to handle. The other approach is to go ahead and interface to that existing system so that all of the modern tooling can happen on top and mainframe developers and maintainers don't have to worry about that interface. And we're here today, and Venkat's going to share a bit more too about Broadcom's approach, which is that embracing of heritage to be able to utilize those best of breed toolings and start working much more quickly without a need to uh, migrate all of that logic on all of the code that exists in, that pro in those projects. So, you know, the, the approach that we are actually taking is, so whenever, let me take it one more step back, right? Whenever we talk about mainframe, you know, you hear the word legacy, right? Um, I don't want to look at it as legacy. Legacy is something that you leave behind. I want to look at it as heritage. That is something that you can actually leverage. You continue to use. You continue to build on, right? The reality is, you know, organizations have invested 30, 40, 50 years of effort in it. And our goal, right, internally for ourselves as well as for our customers is to see how we can leverage or provide, allow that heritage to, can, to, be, to be reused, right? Now, as, as Phil was talking about, obviously there are different approaches, right? For the folks who actually attended the Ford session yesterday, they were actually talking about moving from clear case to GitHub. And that's a perfect use case, right? You know, and, and that's pretty legit. And if there are organizations who have their source code be sitting in a proprietary repository or something else that is off-platform, migrating to GitHub, standardizing on it, is a perfect approach. But is that the answer for all the cases? Probably not, right? And that's one of the things that we're actually going to talk about today. So, so our goal is to say that, you know, there is a, there is a mainframe SCM, right? So for, for the folks who are not familiar with mainframe SCMs, Typical stuff that exists there is it's not just a version control system, right? It is also a build engine. It is actually also a lifecycle management governance audit tool. So what that means is the investment that the organizations have put in and the processes that they have established around it is, is something that needs to be managed, maintained, and you don't want to disrupt that workflow. So that's one of our key, um, you know, bedrock principles as we are looking at this modernization effort. Now, the other thing is, you know, as I said, mainframe run code runs on mainframe, it's built on mainframe, it's deployed on the mainframe. So, and then the number of assets that we're actually talking about actually runs into millions, right? So, so over the years, that's what it has grown to. So 
those things, you know, for if, if, if the approach is to say, hey, you know, you need to take everything out of your SCM and move it to GitHub, and then rebuild or reinvent the, your infrastructure so that you can actually do the builds, the promotion, the lifecycle management, that's a huge task for these mainframe organizations who are still trying to get their head around, you know, DevOps, agile principles, and things like that. So we want to make life easy and, and, and simple using, using, these, uh, using, using our bridging approach. And the other thing that we want to do is, one of the things that mainframe organization are averse to is bringing new tools to the platform. So if you want to get a new tool onto the mainframe, it's a huge task. Because, you know, because of the existing processes in terms of when you know, new mainframe software can be installed, what kind of rigor and checks it needs to go through before it, 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 it gets approved and blessed. So we, want, we don't want to you know, introduce you know, any niche tools onto the platform, but rather leverage something that's there, but still give organizations the flexibility to do their job in using the modern tools. Is this one? Yeah. So, so why Git for mainframe? Right? So, so we talked about why we still need the, the mainframe on the back end. Right? Because it needs to do the build, it needs to do the lifecycle management, there are a set of practices that are established, so we need to kind of preserve that. So why Git? Well, I mean, there is a lot of text on that chart, but the thing that struck me is that October's report that said 1.7 million students learned how to code using GitHub. Now, related back to the slide that Phil had talking about the skill gap, if you think about it, you know, these 1.7 million students who have learned how to code on GitHub are the ones who are going to come into this workforce trying to bridge that skills gap. So providing or having a set of tools that they can understand, they know, they relate to, can actually welcome them to the platform and not put too much burden. <clears throat> that green screen, remember that? We don't want that. Into, to, to, to welcome the new generation of application developers to the platform. Okay? The other thing that I mentioned when we talk to our organization, I mean, the various uh, uh, customers, is they want to standardize, right? I mentioned that they want to use a common set of tools. They want their developers to, 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 to be speaking the same language, same workflow, so that you know, they can actually have full stack developers be developing Java, Ruby, Python or COBOL and be, be familiar with the, with the workflows and the tools that they're actually using. And you know, that involves providing a seamless experience when it comes to uh, you know, how developers are actually interacting, the tools that they're actually using, which, is, which may include their favorite IDE. right? Um, and then you know, leverage the, the proven collaboration practices that are out there to establish that. So that's the reason why we want to actually use Git or standardized on Git for, 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 for mainframe organizations. So then the question arises, what happens to those, you know, my, my good friends who are above or 60, the 30% 60 plus year old mainframers who are really productive with the existing tools? Our solution will give the organizations the flexibility that, so that the existing set of developers who don't know anything about Git, GitHub, they can continue to use their, the tools that they're actually familiar with. They don't have to transform anything. They don't have to change anything. At the same time, you know, allowing the new generation of developers to use you know, their favorite IDE yeah. and the interface that they, that they want to actually go I, with. I definitely identify with the one on the left, as I know a bit of COBOL and have never touched much of a green screen in my life, where you'd probably be a little bit more toward the other side with a lot more of that knowledge. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to admit that, but hey, why not? <laughs> so, so that's, that's the, 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 again, striking that balance, right? Making it easy for enterprises to, 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 to go through this transformation and not you know, change the, the entire workflow processes for everybody with the flip of a switch. So that's what we're actually looking at, right? So what enables that magic? So what we, are, what we have developed is called GitBridge. You know, it's essentially a, a simple Spring Boot Java application that bridges um, GitHub to the mainframe source configuration system. 
So the Git bridge is the magic that's going to manage everything behind the covers from a developer perspective. And you know, a, a traditional mainframe developer can actually use a green screen, Eclipse interface, whatever they want to use, right? They can continue to work on using that. A, more, you know, a new age application developer can use their favorite IDE, VS Code, Eclipse, IntelliJ, you name it, right? And the Git bridge is actually going to manage the synchronization of these two and make it seamless from an from a end user perspective. And they don't have to worry about you know, uh, the interacting with, with, with mainframe. So as you can see on this particular chart, we have identified three different personas. Michelle is our new age application developer. Todd is our enterprise uh, Git administrator. He's the one who's responsible for actually setting up the, the Git enterprise GitHub and also the Git bridge and do the mappings and stuff like that. And we have Carl, who is our, our backend SEM uh, admin. So here is a, basically a simple overview of how, how you know, it works. So the Git bridge, this app actually manages the mapping between a GitHub repository or a branch to whatever is actually sitting on the mainframe SCM in the backend. So, so it, it essentially does the, 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 the mapping management and the synchronization aspects of it. And the components that, that we have in there are, well, the user would actually be interacting with uh, using a, a web uh, uh, UI. And they, there is an email notification that actually comes in when there are some changes that the user has to, to worry about. And then uh, we have a scheduler. Remember, I said the Git bridge is responsible for doing the synchronization. So, so organizations, when they're actually setting up this Git bridge, can say, I want to do the synchronization on a particular schedule. Or we have event-based synchronization mechanism that will actually you know, synchronize the backend mainframe SEM to, to the, um, the, the, the GitHub enterprise repo. Uh, we use JDO for actually doing our persistence. There's logging infrastructure. And then there is an Endeavor Web Services component, which is basically the interacting with the backend mainframe using REST APIs. Remember the CLI aspect of it that actually uh, you know, forced us to have these REST APIs, and that enabled you know, us to do more innovation in this area. We use JGit library to talk to GitHub. There is a GitHub app you know, that pretty much you know, allows us to integrate the, the Git bridge to the GitHub repository. To, to handle any of the authentication, REST APIs, hook management, and stuff like that. So that's a, a very high-level picture of how, how we do it. Now, here is a picture that shows you of our backend you know, SCM system and what the, the, the SDLC lifecycle would look like. So what you're looking at here is basically the different stages, right? The dev, test, prod. This is, this is configurable. So organizations, so this is how the code would actually flow when I talk about lifecycle management on the mainframe, right? So it goes from dev to test one, to test two, to pre-prod, to prod. But that's the workflow that, that you have. And there is a map you know, that, that the backend SCM manages in terms of you know, what artifact is sitting where. So, so it, it has that particular knowledge. And the key thing here to note is there is something called an entry stage. This is where the developers actually work. This is where developers are actually pulling the you know, the latest version from to make the, 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 the further modifications. And why is that important? Because as I said, you know, these backend SEMs typically may have millions of artifacts. To enable this, we don't want to clone all of those million artifacts into a GitHub repository because we don't want it to take like a week before people can actually start using it. So the idea here is the Git bridge will only map to this quote unquote entry stage that the developers are actually working with. So what that does is basically it subsets the amount of uh, you know, artifacts that the users are actually looking at, right? So that way you're not cloning everything. And then the Git bridge has additional functionality to say, oh, if I need a dependency, for example, that is not part of the stuff, you can actually pull it using into, into the working directory using the, using the Git bridge. So that's essentially how the, the magic actually happens. Now, you know, a typical Git developer, right? You know, you have your enterprise Git repo, you create your feature branch, you make your changes, 
and then what you know if you're following the the basic principles you would actually want to do a build just compile a link of your changes without actually being you know we impacting other changes or pulling in other changes from other developers so what we have is you know a, a mechanism so we actually ship a build script that can be customized and it leverages zoe remember that open source project that i mentioned it leverages zoe to facilitate the build of the user changes so this provides the developer isolation and you know in terms of the build so that they can actually build this, their changes validate their changes before actually pushing it back into the into the main repository okay now i've done my job right as a developer i've made my changes i built it i verified it excuse me sorry um, now i want to i want to actually use the workflow so i commit my changes to the enterprise git repo and then the git bridge is going to propagate those changes back to back to the backend scm okay life is great right now what happens when something goes wrong which is the case where carl has made some changes using his ispf interface for the same source modules you know that the user is actually working in a git environment so the collisions are possible so the git bridge actually detects those changes and before it actually pushes or synchronizes those changes back it does a validate there is a validation step where it validates and if there is a conflict that cannot that you know merged automatically it will actually create a private branch and notify the user via email saying hey you know you need to worry about merging in these changes because something else has happened on the back end okay so i have a real recorded demo no voice because i like to talk <laughs> um, so i'll just run through this this particular demo that will give you an idea of how how it actually works so what you're seeing here is our git uh, bridge interface right so this is where todd our end the github admin would actually come in and do the mappings so this is not a typical developer interface that they would actually interact with so he would do the clone he would do the mapping and as you can see there are these cobol artifacts uh, that have been cloned into into a github repo they can actually look at and hey you know there is even syntax highlighting for cobol code awesome now the developer here is you know we are actually again in spirit of opening up open source here is a choice from a developer's perspective this is eclipse shay which is a hosted ide that we have extended for with cobol specific tooling and then you know the developer is working there they'll do a git pull just to make sure that everything is up to date and then create a feature branch right the typical git related activities from the ide and now what i would do is i open up my cobol program where i need to make the changes and as you can see it has you know cobol specific syntax highlighting this is the extensions that we built you can actually do pretty much expect all sorts of common things like you know code assist real time validation for cobol for any other language and uh, you know they don't let architects do coding anymore so all i'm allowed to do is basically make a comment change here so i'm making that particular change in my feature branch so added in a comment once i'm done i can actually go save it and then use leverage the ide capabilities and the git capabilities that are built in to do a comparison of with the current version that's out there so i can use that so i can see my changes and now since i made a very important change i need to build it okay so i'm going to run the script to do the build and what it's doing is essentially it's leveraging zoe as the infrastructure to take the modified artifacts sitting in my feature branch to the mainframe leveraging the build infrastructure that's already been established for years build it and then you can see you know it comes back with the results in terms of whether the build was successful or not and if i want to see the output from the build you know i can issue use the same script and issue a command to see the output from that particular build 
So what it's doing is, again, it's downloading the build output to the IDE so that I can actually go look at it. And as a developer, I can go in, look at that particular output that from, from, that, from the build. And here we go. That's, that's how it looks like. Now, the most important thing to notice here is the comment is still there. So just to prove that is the same version of the code that's actually being built. So I did my change. I validated it. I built it. Now I'm actually going to go through the Git steps of, of committing those changes and pushing those changes to the enterprise repo. So as you can see, you know, I actually am doing a Git push. And it's telling me that new branch doesn't exist. So typical git, git stuff. So I would actually say, you know, issue the set upstream. It's a new branch. It's in there. Now it's actually committed to the to the enterprise repo. And now I can come back here. And typical Git workflow, I'll open a, a pull request. So that, you know, if, if so essentially what you're seeing here is the same Git workflow, right? For, you know, if you, people want to, teams want to actually collaborate, do the code reviews and things like that, all of those capabilities are still intact. And, you know, anybody who understands GitHub can follow the same set of principles and rules that have been established while still working with the mainframe code. So it's merged in. So let's confirm that it's already it's, it's in there. So as you can see, you know, or the comment actually made it. So it is still the, the, the file that I actually modified in my feature branch. And the last step, right? Let's prove that it has actually, the Git bridge has done its job of synchronizing it back with the mainframe SCM. And as you can see, the new comment that we added in there is in the, the repository. So that's pretty much the workflow in terms of how you know, the user is actually interacting with Git without actually knowing what's happening on the back end. And that's the kind of modernization that we're actually bringing to the table uh, you know, for, for mainframe organizations and taking things to the next level. And all we are doing here is leveraging open source tools with the help of some innovation like the Git bridge that we, that we did and bridging the old world to the new world. And so, and so now with the Zoe CLI, I as a per aspiring COBOL programmer with not a lot of knowledge of the underlying infrastructure can use the tools that I already am familiar with, whether that be VS Code, IntelliJ, WordPad, whatever I want to use in order to interact with my repository, interact with it with a Git and Git, push it into GitHub, and then let all the other automations that are available in GitHub run on this repository as well. Whether you want to run some GitHub-specific actions on events in the repository, leveraging what we've seen in some of the keynotes earlier today, leverage of the ability to automatically assign code reviewers via just the core capabilities of the pull request, and then get those changes into the system much more quickly. We're able to branch and work on multiple feature branches at once in mainframe code, which is a very new capability. Exactly. We can start to unblock those weeks to month long deploy queues and start to get them more in sync with the other projects that are being built on top of this logic that, we, that everyone has been previously waiting for the mainframe organization to deploy to production so we can actually get the rest of those features and those applications out the door. So essentially, you know, letting the mainframe organizations know what is possible, right, and the existing set of tools, you know, from a CI perspective, CD perspective, can be leveraged for the mainframe code as well. Right? One of the things that I and Phil were talking about just before this presentation is our next step is to actually incorporate GitHub actions into this particular demo and pretty much go through the whole CI CD process. Right? That's which is possible, you know, we we just didn't get there. Pretty exactly. Soon. Yeah. We will, but you know, that's the progression that, that we're actually looking at. So with that, we're uh, really excited to be able to share this story with you today. And uh, if you have any questions, want to ask us anything here after the presentation, Venkat and I will be around for a while. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming on out and taking some time to learn about the exciting future of a very established heritage technology and how we can continue to bring new people onto that platform. 
Thank you.